150-250 in your hymnals, please. So we're wondering who the next president of the United States is. We don't know for sure yet, but I can tell you one thing that I do know about the administration of this country and every other country in the world. There will come a day when we don't talk about the president anymore. We'll be talking about the king. And so here is a song that assures us on biblical fact that there will come a day when Jesus Christ will rule the world as king. So this is a joyful song. Let's stand together. And uh, first, second, and fourth. One, two, and four of 250. seated. And just before Nathan comes with the message of the hour, I do have an evening review. And so here's a quiz uh, from the morning study. Ten pretty simple questions based on what it was that we looked at this morning. So number one, in our study of Jehoshaphat this morning, the first main point of the message was A, the location of Egypt, or B, the weapons of the enemy, or C, Jehoshaphat's dependence on God, or D, the hope of the Jews. C, Jehoshaphat's dependence on God. Number two, there was a coalition of three nations that arose to attack Judah. Uh, there were the Munites, or the Edomites, and the Ammonites. Who was the third group? A, the Egyptians, B, the Moabites, C, the Assyrians, or D, the Hittites? B. B, the Moabites, good job. Number three, Second Chronicles chapter 20 records Jehoshaphat's finest hour. This was A, when he led 1.1 million Jewish soldiers against the enemy, or B, when he held up his sword in defiance of the enemy, or three, when he, uh, C, when he led the people in building a great emergency wall around Jerusalem, or D, when he led Judah in prayer to Jehovah? D. D. Good job. Number four. Jehosh Je Jehoshaphat's great prayer called on the memory of a prayer by a previous king of Israel. This king was A, David, or B, Asa, C, Solomon, or D, Rehoboam? Solomon. C. Good job. Number five, Jehoshaphat's finest hour was in this prayer of trust, dependence, and petition to the Lord. He said, we are powerless, we do not know what to do, but, finish the sentence. Okay, close, close. Our eyes are on you, but our eyes are on you. Number six, 
God gave instructions which Jehoshaphat immediately and wholeheartedly obeyed. God said to A, send the archers into the battle first. B, put a flank attack into motion to the south. C, don't fight, watch. Or D, stay behind the walls. C, don't fight, watch. Number seven, Jehoshaphat and the whole nation did in fact trust God completely. We know this because Jehoshaphat ordered who to lead the way towards the enemy. A, the king's own guard. B, the singers and musicians. C, the heavy, heavy infantry. Or D, the tribe of Benjamin. B, the singers. Number eight, when the Jews got to the edge of the wilderness, what did they see? Open-ended question. Corpses, dead bodies as far as the eye could see. Number nine, how many days did it take to collect the, the spoil? Three days, and on the fourth day they did what? Had a great Thanksgiving celebration. Number 10, we see the final point of the message, Jehovah, Jehovah's faithfulness, not only in his rescue of Judah from the enemy army, but also in the final paragraph of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, what did God do as Jehoshaphat was building ships at Ezi and Geber? He destroyed them, and how does that show God's faithfulness? Because he made an un, un, uh, wicked alliance with Ahab's son Ahaziah, and, and God was faithful to say, you can't do that. That's wrong. Uh, very good. Okay. We are still in the Gospel of Matthew, and Nathan and I have been praying and working on next year's preaching calendar, and I know that you'll be excited to hear that Mass Matthew will continue for most of 2021, too. So we're having a good time in the book, and we'll be there for a good deal of next year. Nathan is coming to preach to us right now. Good evening. I am hoping that my voice holds out. See how this goes. I had some tea this afternoon. I have a limited amount of words, so I'm not gonna talk too much. Anyway. So, if you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And um, let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done. And we thank you for your goodness and your grace to us. And we thank you for the opportunity to come together to look at your word, to instruct us, to edify us, and then for us to apply. I pray that you would be with me, give me clarity of thought, give me discernment. And uh, I pray that you would help us to not be discouraged about what we see around us, but help us to be encouraged by what we see here in your word and our reminders of who you are. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in Matthew chapter 10 for the third week in a row. Jesus is instructing his 12 disciples. He's preparing them for ministry and he's giving them instruction. That is the context. As such, we remember that these are not direct instructions to us, yet there are many things for us to learn in this passage. We are going to be looking primarily at verses 34 through 42 tonight. Um, as a reminder, I'm going to actually start, and we're going to go ahead and read through the passage, starting at verse 5 and go to the end of the chapter, just so, we, just so we're reminding ourselves where we're at. Jesus has called his disciples, he's called them by name, and so now starting in verse five, I'm just going to read to the end of the chapter just so we have the context. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. 
Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. In whatever king or uh, city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable in the land, for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep into the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in the synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake. As for, <clears throat> sorry, as for testimony to them and to the Gentiles, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that, be, that, he, <clears throat> that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the household Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered, so do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that they came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of the little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. There's a lot there. And we are going to look primarily at verses 34 through 42. Now you can imagine Jesus is giving his instructions to his disciples. And we see at first that there might be those who do not want to hear what the disciples have to say. But then it transitions and gets to the point where there are going to be those who do not want to hear and they are going to try to silence those who are sharing the gospel. And so Jesus gives him instruction, and we looked at that last week. 
And you can almost kind of, I don't know, here's Jesus, God of the universe, come as man. He's giving instructions to his disciples. They think Jesus is wonderful. And most of the crowds who are following Jesus all over the place think the same. And yet now he's talking about conflict and those who do not want to hear. And not only conflict with governors and other religious leaders, but from their own families. And verse 34 almost seems to be Jesus' response to his disciples, maybe the thoughts that they were rattling around in their head at that point. Do not think that I come to bring peace on the earth. Wait a minute, I thought he was the Prince of Peace. What's up with that? Well, in all reality, there isn't going to be any peace right now, is there? There is going to be one day, but right now there isn't peace. And why is that? In order to understand why there's going to be division, why is there going to be such pushback? Why is there going to be this desire or, or this conflict that Jesus describes. Keep your finger here. Turn with me to John, the Gospel of John. Chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that came into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Who's the light? Jesus. Jesus. What does he do? Shine into the darkness. The darkness does not comprehend it. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world. The world was made through him. and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Jesus came into this earth as light shining in the darkness. There are those who received him and those who rejected him. Turn over, if you need to, depending on the size of your font, to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 16 of John. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. One more place. Keep your finger in Matthew, keep going. To the right, we're going to Ephesians. Chapter five. Starting in verse six. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the son of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly of dark, formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. <clears throat> trying, to learn, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret, but all things become visible when they are exposed to the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Turn back to Matthew. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But the world is not light, is it? It's darkness. And when the light shines on different spots of the world, it's like, um, who's ever gone in? Um, my, both my grandparents were farmers. And one of my grandparents, um, my papa, my mom's dad, would deliver grain to lots of different farmers and seed and minerals. And you'd go in the warehouse, and flip on the light, right? Or you'd go up in the hayloft and you'd turn on the light, and what happens? Everything scatters. Run away! Because the mice's deeds are evil. No, no, just. But we live in a world who likes to try to get away with as much as possible, right? They're in rebellion against God. Those who do not know Christ as their savior are rebelling against God. And those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ are now in the light. But the darkness doesn't like the light. And it is not that Jesus is wanting us to actively cause contention with our neighbors or our family members, or our coworkers, but simply by being a believer in Christ, standing for what is right in God's word, standing for this, there's going to be contention that, caught, that occurs. We are the antithesis to the world. We are we, by simply professing Christ as our Savior and walking in Him, we are antithetical or we are against everything that the world stands for. And that's going to create problems. It's going to create conflict. And so we're actually going to be looking at three main things today. We're going to see that Christ causes conflict. We're also going to see that there are requirements for discipleship, and we're also going to see that there are rewards for faithfulness as a disciple of Christ. So the first thing we see is that there's conflict, verses 34 through 36. And the conflict that is shown is not just conflict with someone out there, it's within your own home. And think about, I mean, family is pretty important nowadays. And we, ha we live in a secular society that's tried everything else. They've tried, well, maybe money's where it's at. Uh, maybe good, ex fun experiences where it's at. But uh, quite often, it ends up, well, life, it's all about family. If you don't have family, you have nothing. So family before everything else. I mean, even at work or something like that, in several of the places that I've worked, listen, I've got a family emergency, I need to take care of this, I can't come. Oh yeah, well, family first, right? And okay, that's, that's not bad. You do need to take care of your family, but family is not the end all be all. And in Jewish culture, the family and dedication and um, commitment to family was extremely important. I mean, notice, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, I mean, that was supposed to be a tight 
relationship and as well. I mean, that is not Western uh, society today, but in Jewish culture, the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law were expected to have a close relationship, and even that was, even any of these relationships were going to be set against each other just simply because someone knew Christ and someone else didn't, and it was going to cause division and strife. And so there was going to be conflict. If you think about it, do we see it? Maybe not at the same, exi at the same level of we saw earlier in the pa uh, passage where family members were going to deliver each other up for death. But maybe, and I have firsthand experience in this and secondhand experience, one through my own family, not my parents, but uh, one through my own family and, not, and the other through my wife's family, where the only time they, well, we're going to plan something, and when is it? When is the plan for the family get together? Sunday. It's on a Sunday. And when are the hours? Right about in the middle of the Sunday morning service, right? And then you have a decision to make. Well, why aren't you, are you not good enough to meet with us? Why aren't you calling? This, my wife, her family, Shari, when she and Shari got saved, the family would had in the past had been planning it on other days other than Sunday. And when they found out they had become Christians, were going to church, they would intentionally plan things on the Sundays when they couldn't come to see how they would respond. And Misty and Shai had a choice to make. You get called names. You're a Bible thumping Christian now. There's conflict and contention there. Were Shari and Misty looking to cause trouble? Well, no. But it comes because men love darkness rather than light. Men love their own sin. And when a believer comes into a situation, it sheds light in some way, and people see maybe their own sinfulness and their own guilt before a holy and righteous God, and they don't like it. Not because of us, but because of God, right? It's not because I'm some great person. It's because of God. So there is conflict, and there's a decision to be made. And we see that there's conflict, but the next thing I want us to look at is the requirements for discipleship. A disciple is a follower. Remember, Jesus had those who were kind of following, but for discipleship to go further at this point, something has to happen. So, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Um, in a, Jesus is not, this is not the only time Jesus talks about this particular instance. If you want to write down, if you're taking notes, Luke 14, 26 and 27 is another passage you can look up at a different time. And Jesus says it this way, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, I hate? What is that supposed to mean? I, I thought we were supposed to love everyone, right? What does hate mean, and Jesus is using extremes. In comparison to my love for God, my commitment to following God, all other relationships, everything else, everyone else I know, all relationships that I have take second stage or take a back seat compared to my relationship with God. That's where it needs to start, specifically Jesus. 
And so here in Matthew, chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus talks about a love. And this is actually interesting because it is not agape, that what we think of as like an unconditional love. This is actually uh, phileo, which is a brotherly love, an affection, a desire to know them and get to know them. And our affections are, be are to be directed towards Christ above all else. Yes, I love you, but I love Jesus more. Um, there's times when I'm correcting my children and they hope that I love them enough to not correct them. I'm, Daddy loves you, but I have to obey God. I love God more. So because I love God more, you need to be corrected right now. That's a freebie. Um, anyway. So, love for family was one of the highest priorities of the Jewish culture. But when f forced to choose between family and Christ, we must choose Christ. It is paramount. Christ must become ev before every other relationship we, that we have. That doesn't mean that we ignore our family. That doesn't mean we abuse them or anything like that. If anything, earlier in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. If we're seeking God and what he wants first, it's kind of like an umbrella. It kind of catches everything else under. Because if I'm loving God and I'm wanting to do what he wants, what is that going to do in affecting my relationships with my family? I'm going to love them. But my first affection, my first desire must be Christ above all else. Because actually, Jesus is actually pretty clear. If there are things that we love more than him, it's not that we're no longer saved, but we are not worthy of him. This is not, it's not, it's sobering. It's a challenge and a reminder. It's not a threatening with loss of salvation, though. But then he continues on. So there's requirements for discipleship, and they're costly. Loving Christ and having an affection for him above all else. But then, cross. We have a cross. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What do we mean by take up my cross? Does that mean like we wear a nice necklace? I've got a cross necklace. No, I, I don't have a cross necklace. But someone who wears a cross necklace, right? Does that mean what it means? I, I'm bearing my cross. Or, uh, well, I have a touch of the asthma, or uh, I'm really sore, my back, and that's just my cross to bear. Is that, what is this? Is it like, it's, well, we all have our cross to bear. Is that, what, is that what's going on here? Has, for one thing, has Jesus died yet in this? No. Was the cross something that was um, popular during Jesus' time? Or was it just like, oh, I just love going to crucifixions or so? I would just love to be crucified. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I'm being a little bit facetious. Okay, maybe a lot facetious. But um, the cross was a token of shame. The Romans 
were masters at trying to cause as much pain and humiliation to their prisoners that were about to be executed. And the process of execution was extremely uncomfortable. And yet Jesus is saying, take up my cro your cross and follow me. Jesus, when he was getting ready to be crucified, what did he have to carry and ended up having to be helped carry to Golgotha? His cross. So when it means that you're taking up your cross, when Jesus took up his cross, where was he headed? To death. To death. And he says, take up your cross and follow me. What are the implications? Have we thought about that? The implications are that when I'm picking up this cross, I am taking up the very instrument of my death and I'm going and following Christ. And what did Christ do? He died and I'm willing to do the same. Follow after me, follow me, do the same thing that I'm doing. We as Christians in America, just a small, small experience of that where right now Christians aren't very popular in America right now, right? People kind of make fun of us, they think we're ridiculous, they think we're stupid, unloving, uncaring, call us names. Think about the implications for the disciples. The majority of them were going to end up dying for the sake of Christ. It's rather interesting. So when we take up our cross and follow Christ, it means that we are committing to live a life that is willing and ready to die. We're dying to ourselves and living to Christ. Verse 39 is an indicator or a, an explanation. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Christ says, if you, do not, if you love your father or mother more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love your children more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you do not pick up your, take up your cross and follow me, head in the same direction as me, you are not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The idea of finding your life or losing your life is in the context of following Christ. So if finding your life has to do with, you know, I have a pretty good life. I'm comfortable. I'm trying to find the satisfaction and the contentment that I am looking for in this life and the things that I'm experiencing and the things that I'm doing. If we are grasping at this life to try to find our happiness and contentment, Jesus tells us that we will ultimately lose it. But if we're willing to lose our lives, if we're willing to be a living sacrifice for Christ and live our lives for God, we will find it. In this life, well, probably not. which leads us to the third point, which is reward. So, verse 40, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me, him who sent, receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 
And whoever in the name of, the dis of a disciple gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. There's a lot going on there. But the point is this. Verse 40 and 41. Those who are a part of helping those who are doing the work of God get to share in some part, some part, and they get some recognition from God that God sees the part that they're playing. And there is a reward for that. Now, that doesn't mean we say, oh, I hope I get lots of rewards. That's okay. Yes, but that's not the goal, not so I can show off all the rewards I have in heaven. But as we are a part of the work of those who are serving God, as we are helping and interacting, God sees that. And it is recognized. Verse 42, what's up with a cold cup of water? Even the smallest things, God sees. Nothing is too small for God to overlook. God knows what is going on. He sees what we are going through. Our lives, if we are picking up our cross and following after him, if we are having an affection for Christ more than anyone else, our lives are not wasted. We find them. God sees, and it's not a waste. So how do we, today, how do we apply what we read here? We're not to be surprised by conflict even within our families. Conflict shouldn't surprise us. If we are claiming the name of Christ, if we're pursuing Christ, it will cause conflict somewhere at some level. The next thing, we need to under, next thing we need to ask ourselves is, are we willing to suffer humiliation and shame for the sake of following Christ? Take up your cross and follow me. It's an item of shame. It would be like wearing an electric chair around your neck or a hangman's noose. Being willing to die for the sake of Christ. It's uncomfortable. It can be discouraging. But I want to read one more thing from you, for you. And you can, keep, you can just turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul, the apostle, is writing to the church in Corinth. He's describing what he is, he and his um, assistants or helpers or partners are doing. They're sharing the gospel. And we're going to start in verse 7 of chapter 4. Remember, this is someone, think about Paul, everything he went through. I, shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, falsely accused, imprisoned, and eventually he was going to be martyred. Verse 7 to the end of the chapter. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the treasure? If you look a little before, it's Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What are the earthen vessels? It's us. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but, do, but are not crushed perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us 
but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who has raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may also cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's a very good encouragement to us. There's a story my dad tells about when he was about 14 or 15 years old in the dentist chair. Who loves the dentist? And the dentist was a Jewish man, and the dentist was asking my dad questions with his mouth, in his hands in his mouth, I, I can't imagine. But asking why the foolishness of my dad's cousins going back to Central Africa to be missionaries to share the gospel. I mean, those people over there are perfectly happy the way they are. They don't need whatever. Why do that? Why do that? Because serving God, sharing the gospel, with people in Africa is what God wanted my second whatever cousins to do. And they did not waste their lives doing it either. I would encourage you to read some church history. There are men and women who have given their lives for the sake of Christ, who took up their crosses, followed after Christ, and their lives were not a waste. And they are challenges and reminders to us what are we going to do today? How am I going to follow Jesus today? We are Christians first, who happen to live in America. Some thoughts. How are we going to live in light of that? In light of what God's word tells us about what is important and what's not what's most important. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Please help us. We are so feeble and frail. We look at the uncertainty and the affliction, and it can be scary. It makes us nervous. Please help us to trust you and know that you are with us. Help us to live for you faithfully, knowing that this life is not all there is, but that there is a life far greater of eternal consequence waiting for us. Help us to live faithfully in light of that. In Jesus' name, amen.